Um, I was corrected about something that I said, I think, yesterday, and, and I want to make sure uh, that that makes sense. I said that on a spherical triangle, the three angles, which don't add up to 180 degrees the way they do in flat space, could be anything, but that's not true. It could be anything between 180 degrees and 540 degrees. So, um, in case you pay attention to geometry, <laughs> uh, I'd like to correct that. Okay. Um, so, I will continue while these kinds of um, try to make things work for me. Um, Petrarch wrote absolutely brilliant sonnets in Italian, so much so. Oh, wonderful, even better. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Save my voice. Thanks. Uh, that better, I hope. Good. I can speak softer, then I don't have to shout quite so much. A lot of brilliant people here <laughs> will make this work eventually. Uh, good heavens. That is the... What a genius. I hate to sound chauvinistic, but it takes a woman to fix it, I think. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> oh boy. Oh well. Who knows? <laughs> anyway, um, as m most of us who grew up in the non computer age know, computers can be very helpful, but uh, wonderful. But they can also be um, difficult. Can you set up my thing? Thank you. What Petrarch did, and he wrote these phenomenally beautiful sonnets, so much so that back in 1350 or 1360 when he was writing them, that codified Italian, with a little help from Boccaccio and a little help from Dante, but basically from Petrarch. And Italian has not, unless there's an Italian scholar here, to my knowledge, Italian hasn't basically changed very much since then. It's obviously added uh, fancy words, uh, modern words, but it is the same language. Um, he also, uh, Petrarch is also called the first tourist. Uh, I want to, uh, okay, that's, that's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll fix it from here. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm fine. Good. Um, he was the first person to record, at least, travels just for the hell of it. Uh, he climbed some big mountain just for fun and as a tourist. And we don't have any records of anybody doing things like that, traveling just for fun uh, before him. Now, um, the Renaissance with a lowercase r from the 12th and 13th century, which is so important, had been primarily a scientific change. But the Renaissance with a, an uppercase R um, was very different. It was, uh, to a large extent, anti-literary. Um, it, uh, because, I'm sorry, because the original 12th and 13th century people were anti-literary and pro-scientific, this new renaissance of the 14th and 15th centuries became just the opposite, became anti-scientific and pro-literary. The influence in the 12th and 13th centuries of Muslim, Jewish, and Christian people had really created, as I've said over and over, an exaltation of Aristotle and his philosophy. And a lot of this was due to the interpretations of, of the Islamic uh, the, um, philosopher Averroes. And so Petrarch uh, became both anti 
uh, Aristotle an anti averroes even though quite honestly he never he couldn't read greek and he certainly could read latin but he did not pay much attention or know much about aristotle There were a, a number of people, of course, who followed Petrarch, uh, and the only one I want to mention at all, really, is a, a man named Pico della Mirandola, because he discovered um, the Kabbalah, the Hebrew mystical treatise, and he incorporated that into Christianity and gave rise um, to women like Madonna, who still uh, pay attention to the Kabbalah 600 years later. But, um, but the most important person, really, was a Dutchman, Desiderio Erasmus. Erasmus really was the king, uh, the greatest of the early Renaissance humanists. In the year just before Luther, Luther pub uh, nailed his theses to the door in 1517. In 1516, Erasmus published a new version of the Bible. The Bible, used by Catholicism, uh, and there was nothing else uh, in those days except Catholicism, the Bible had been put together by St. Jerome uh, back in the fourth century, 380 something, okay? And it was called the Vulgate, um, Bible, uh, Vulgate being the Latin for in common use, to which we have changed the word to vulgar, which it is, does not mean. It just meant a, in, in common use in this day. It was the common Bible. But that was back in the fourth century, and now we're in the 14th century, a thousand years later. There had been innumerable copies of that Bible made, and every time you make a copy, uh, there were errors introduced, and so Jerome set out to, I'm sorry, uh, Erasmus set out to uh, collect every copy of the Vulgate Bible he could find and put them together and try to come up with an, a, a, a reasonable, uh, ordinary Bible. Uh, he is certainly the greatest of the early humanists, as I've said. Um, He polished up the, the language um, because he, uh, he said, and if I quote, um, it's only fair that Paul should address the Romans in somewhat better Latin. What had happened with um, Petrarch uh, is that he discovered um, a, a book written by Cicero, uh, which was... Had, had been secret, I was certainly, you know, 13 or 1400 years old. And the Latin in that book was considerably different from the Latin that was being spoken in the universities. Uh, and that's because the scholastics were interested in the philosophical ideas, they weren't interested in the purity of the language. And so, with, starting with, uh, with him, and then certainly with Erasmus, um, the idea of the purity of the Latin language became um, really very important. Um, and by publishing this Bible in 1516, Erasmus's idea was to reinvigorate Christianity, or Catholicism, which was the only Christianity that existed. And he wrote in Latin for the highly educated people. Latin-speaking elite, and he promoted the, the study of language as the path to understanding scripture. He created issues that were most important to the humanists of his time, the preference for rhetoric and language over logic and philosophical ideas. Um, so he emphasized philology, phil, phil, el, philology and, lang and language studies uh, with a call for a return to the 
primary uh, language. He um, loved the term barbarian, which he used. Uh, you know, that comes from the Greek who said, um, all people who don't speak Greek see bar, 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 so they're barbarians. Um, <laughs> now that's true, I'm told, by a Greek, but. Uh, the, um, yeah, that was his favorite term of abuse, uh, and it was directed at the scholastics, primarily at the scholastics, um, because they were, as he put it, ret rhetorically impaired. Um, he and his fellow um, correspondents gilded their letters with quotes from, from uh, Virgil and from Cicero and so forth. Um, he dismissed the vernacular tongues which are springing up all over Europe, German and Polish and, and, and French, etc. Um, he called them all vulgar. So uh, he was, a, on one hand, a champion of, co of common humanity, and the other hand, a world-class snob. Um, the church at that time was in great trouble. And the trouble was due to what is called simony. And when you died, if you didn't go directly to hell, they had invented this intermediate state called purgatory. That doesn't exist in the Bible, but it had been invented. So we would go after we die, we'd go to purgatory, we'd spend some time in purgatory and wash the sins away, and then purgatory had only one exit, and that was up to heaven. Um, and if you could get a dispensation from a priest forgiveness for your sin, then you could shorten the time you had to stay in purgatory. Well, one of the ways to get a priest to um, forgive your sins was to grease their palms with silver. And this is called simony uh, and was a great problem uh, in those days. Um, and it caused at least Martin Luther, to, to, uh, who was an Augustan monk, um, to nail his 95 theses to the door of the Wittenberg Cathedral in 1517. The printing press, which had been invented about 1440 by Gutenberg, made the distribution of what Luther, Luther's theses made them um, available uh, widely. Um, so that Erasmus wrote in this beautiful Latin, but Luther, who was more interested in the common man, wrote in uh, vernacular languages, primarily German, of course. He wanted to evangelize uh, the masses. And so for years, they, these two men won, uh, waged a battle of, of ideas. They were originally good friends, but uh, they changed. Each was seeking to win Europe over to his side. Uh, but Erasmus's uh, reformist and universal creed, his, his snobbish creed, if you like, couldn't match the populism of, of uh, Luther. Uh, something we see in politics today, certainly in the United States, where, I, where politics matters for the whole world. Um, uh, so that even Eras many of Erasmus's closest disciples eventually defected and became Lutheran. Um, he was scorned by the Catholics for being um, too, too liberal, um, and too critical of the church, and he was scorned by the Lutherans for being too timid. Um, he, as well, so as well as being a snob, he was the archetypal reasonable liberal of his time. Um, now, even 700 years ago, let's see if I can get the right slide up. <clears throat> 
young boy. Well, I thought I could. Well, let me turn the lights off so you can read that, I hope. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a Mac person. I don't... Middle at the top. Oh, slideshow, right you are. Uh, from the currents. There we go. Um, this sounds like something which is um, quite reasonable. Um, the English are hostile to the French uh, because they're French, Scot, you know, people dislike each other for no reason at all. Uh, the mere name of a, just uh, the name of something uh, is enough. to divide people when we should be bringing them together. This um, New York Review of Books uh, has a very interesting article about Luther versus Erasmus. Um, populism first eclipsed the liberal elite. Uh, it's an interesting, uh, interesting statement. Um, biblical studies had uh, been reserved entirely for theolog theologians, and all the theologians were scholastic and they did not like these upstart humanists uh, who were trespassing on their turf. And they did not think these language people, these philolog phil philologically trained people, would, did not have any of the necessary um, qualifications to study the Bible, and they were highly likely to introduce doctrinal errors uh, in, in, into the, the, the discussion. But the humanists, said that, look, a correct understanding of what's in the Bible requires you to understand Greek and Hebrew and as they were at the time when the Bible was written, which is obviously impossible. Um, and as I said, Luther was originally favorable to, to uh, Erasmus, but uh, that didn't last long. Um, and his stray, he stressed so much faith over good works, which is what Erasmus uh, was doing, that it became a, a painful separation. Both men were interested in reforming the church, but from very different, uh, very different viewpoints. And um, the controversy that arose between them could not be avoided by anyone at the time. Uh, Erasmus quoted all sorts of learned people. He, he uh, quoted uh, Don Scotus and so forth in his um, support for arguments against Luther. Uh, and he made the following statement, which I also find you are the sole interpreter. Uh, that is so true of a lot of demagogues. Um, I don't think that Martin Luther is particularly a demagogue, but he seems to have acted uh, very much in that way. Um, uh, Erasmus was living in the city of Basel in Switzerland, but Basel um, adopted Lutheranism, and, and Erasmus was a Catholic, so he left and went to Germany to a Catholic country. Um, Back in 1536, he was headed back to Holland, which was his native country, and he was passing through Basel when he got sick and died there. Um, and so he's buried in a city which he had abandoned for religious reasons. Physics and mathematics and astronomy were all making big advances in the 14th century. Um, and, and as the 14th turned into the 15th, there was um, people such as Nicholas of Cusa and um, this is um, such a confusing statement that I don't understand it um, and I don't think he understood it either but what he was trying to do was to weigh air with that wonderful old spelling. Um, 
But this is very similar to what Galileo was famous for doing, which was uh, dropping things uh, and measuring the time uh, that, that they took to fall. Um, he had also had ideas about what we would call the conservation of matter. That is, you cannot create or destroy uh, matter normally. But he had some weird ideas as well. Uh, he thought that the Earth was a star, just like other stars in the heaven, that it's not at the center of the universe, that it's not at rest, and its poles wander around. That's true, by the way. The poles do wander around. The North Pole was once in China, um, in, in the Gobi Desert somewhere, the magnetic North Pole, not the, uh, not the rotational North Pole. Um, he thought that there were uh, life on other worlds, that we are not unique. Despite these crazy ideas, he was nonetheless became a cardinal of the Catholic Church. Um, and like so many of his contemporaries, was viciously uh, anti-Islamic and anti-Semitic. A much more serious astronomer is a man named George Purbach. Uh, who was born in, four, in 1423 and died a mere 37 years later, far too young. We don't know much about his early life, uh, but he obviously studied in Vienna and was in, in Italy for some number of years. But by 1454, he was lecturing on, on, um, on Latin poetry at the University of Vienna but he was appointed court astrologer to the king of Bohemia and Hungary. At Vienna, he met Johannes Müller von Königsberg, who is better known by the Latin name of Regio Montanus, a very famous man. Regio Montanus had graduated from the University of Vienna in 1452 at the ripe old age of 15. Um, the two men worked together. They published a revised version of Alphonsine's tables of um, the movement of stars and eclipses and so forth. Um, and Purbach's greatest work was uh, a book called The New Theory of the Planets, which was the standard astronomy university textbook um, for ab about 100 years, much studied by both Copernicus and Kepler. The best data for the prediction of eclipses was still, the uh, when he was young, still the, the Alphonsine tables, but he was looking for an eclipse, and it was eight minutes earlier than predicted, and that's why he knew that, that those tables needed uh, some modification. And he started to try to modify them as early as, 14, as 1460 and was joined by Regio Montanus. Um, and Montanus had to complete it because in 1461 um, Purbach died. People still were doing what is primarily theoretical ideas without any experimental backup, without ever checking any of their facts. And that, of course, is what science is really all about. Um, people did really weird things. Nicholas Oresma, who I talked about a little bit yesterday, uh, was uh, interested in the generation of an animal from the corpse of a dead animal of a different species. And so he tried to generate a fox from the corpse of a dead dog. Um, a little crazy. Um, but the, the greatest achievements in, this, in the time leading up to Isaac Newton, was, who was the revolution in, in the 17th century, were in two basic areas. And the first area was in mechanics. To this day, mechanics is the first subject that students study if they take a physics course at university. They start with classical mechanics. And that's often sad, because Newtonian mechanics can be very boring. 
but you can't, and, and everybody would like to start with quantum mechanics and understand how atoms work. And you, you really can't without some, some sort of basis. Um, mechanics, which is a Greek word, mechaniki, uh, is that area of science concerned with the behavior of physical bodies subject to forces or displacements and the subsequent effects of the bodies on their environment. Um, and this science itself is divided into two areas, statics, or things which are either moving at constant velocity or not moving at all, and dynamics, where objects are subject to external forces and they change their state of motion because of that. And great strides were made in this field leading up to Isaac Newton. And the other area, of course, of great uh, advance was in astronomy with the work of Copernicus, Tycho Brahe, and eventually Galileo. So um, if I first tried to deal with mechanics, I don't know how I got that slide up. Um, Most historians feel that the renaissance of the 14th and 15th century was an interruption in the development of science. And on the other hand, humanists from the renaissance, they did provide useful help in other ways. And the greatest help was in the development of mathematics. And there were incredibly fine uh, mathematicians. I mentioned Fibonacci the other day, certainly one. Nemerarius. There were people at Merton College at Oxford, Richard Brandewein and Richard of Wallingford. And then, of course, there was Eresma and there was Regiomontanus. Um, but there was no tradition yet for the development of mathematics. And those people I mentioned used uh, Hindu numerals, but most people continued using Latin numerals. Is that something we need to pet? I didn't understand a word, but that's all right. What? Oh. Oh, it's a testing of the... Okay. <clears throat> um, because of the discovery of, uh, of some of the ancient Greek works, um, the work of Archimedes became um, widely available. To, to people. And Archimedes was a remarkable, remarkable man. He is considered by historians of science, as I've said before, to be one of the three greats of that field, along with Newton and Einstein. Um, and I can remember many years ago, when I was still doing research, I went to a talk by a physicist from the University of British Columbia named Bill Unruh, William Unruh. And Bill is an extraordinarily well-known man in general relativity, Einstein's theory of gravity. And he said he learned a great deal about, about Einsteinian geometry by reading Archimedes, volume two. He said, I couldn't understand volume one. It was too hard. But volume two was very useful. Uh, so uh, he was, um, Archimedes was a very important man. And this extension of mathematics to the physical science was a real revolution because Archimedes had sharply divided mathematics from, from physics, from, from science. Um, and this is part of the way in which we, uh, the, we changed from asking why things happen to describing how things work. That is the change from philosophy to science, if you like. Um, And a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of this happened because of practical applications, of course. Um, the Greeks had spent a lot of time on statics problems, but some of the scholastics began to work on dynamical problems. Um, 
the idea which started in the 13th century began to grow that the purpose of science was to be useful to mankind and to make things better uh, for people. And um, it's easier to, sort of, to try and explain how the scientific revolution came about than to explain why it came about. And um, the initial stages of what I'm talking about came well before the invention of really crucial instruments, the telescope, the microscope, the thermometer, good clocks. It came about largely from a, a, a change in the outlook of intellectual outlook and in the types of questions that were, people were asking. Why this took place is unfortunately obscure. We don't, historians don't, really don't know. It's not just that increased attention was paid to observation and to the use of experimental and mathematical techniques. It's still an, a subject of deep investigation by historians of science. Part of the answer most likely lies with the use of science for practical applications. And as is so often the very unfortunate case, many of these uh, um, applications were military. Uh, Gunpowder was a new thing, artillery, projectiles. Um, there was a oh, important question of what angle to put a cannon in order that the cannonball goes the farthest distance. In the absence of air, the answer is 45 degrees. Um, but um, in the presence of air and the friction of air, it's a complicated question. Now, in Aristotle's absolutely mad idea, you know, people could tell that objects thrown up did not go like that. I mean, in the theory of impetus, all that happened was that the air would come around behind the thing and push it along in a straight line. That meant if you put a, a cannon on the ground, it would fall into the ground without going anywhere. And then there was some intermediate stage where this died off and then gravity took over. And in reality, what happens, of course, is a parabola. And there's uh, 45 degrees, which is the farthest um, range in the, in the absence of air. <coughs> One of the very first people to worry about such problems was a very famous man, Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, he was born in 1452 in Florence and educated, as was true in Florence, in the very platonic method. But he moved to Milan, which was an Aristotelian city, and so he changed and was influenced both by scholastics and by the humanist ideals. Um, and he had access to serious mathematics. And of course, as we all know, uh, he was a remarkable intellect. But he was particularly made use of Archimedes' work. Um, he unfortunately did follow the Greeks in, in some ways. Um, so he thought that uh, what he called motive power, and we call force, was somehow proportional to the velocity of an object. And that's, of course, not true. What we know from Isaac Newton is that force is related to the acceleration, the change of velocity of an object, this being an equation even more important than E equals mc squared, which every human being seems to know somehow. Force, applied force, an object of mass m will accelerate, will change its state of motion by an amount which is the applied force divided by the mass uh, of the object. So they create changes of velocity. And this is the idea that Newton introduced, which is perhaps the most significant idea in mechanical theory. That is the idea of inertia, that is, once an object is moving at constant 
speed. It requires no force to keep it moving. It will move forever. And the reason we don't see that happening, of course, is because there is a force in normal uh, that we see all the time, even though we don't notice it. Or, or, and it's called friction, which is what stops things from moving uh, forever and ever. Uh, he did get a lot of things right, the impossibility of perpetual motion, and he understood that the velocity of a ball rolling down an inclined plane was constantly accelerated in a, in a way similar to that of a dropped object. And of course, Galileo himself did that experiment because when you drop an object, it takes a very short time to get to the floor. And he did not have clocks anywhere near accurate enough to measure that time. But if you roll an object down an inclined plane, it takes a long time. Uh, and his clock was made of water, so that he would start the object moving, open a valve, let water run in, and he would close the valve when it got to the bottom, and then he'd weigh the water. And heavier water meant a longer time. So it wasn't in seconds he was working in, in, in weights of water. Um, but he, um, Leonardo also believed, unfortunately, in this Archimedean idea that air rushes behind something and pushes it along. But um, in this time, in the 15th century, there was great advances made in mathematics, and people began to discover more and more of Greek mathematicians. And the following symbols were, were being used. Before this, before the 16th century, people used and, times, minus, greater than, less than, or the, they used words. And now, of course, starting in the 16th century, we just used symbols, and they started then, and we still use the same symbols and today. So that in the 16th and 17th centuries, algebra began to look very much uh, like the way uh, we think of it today. And uh, Descartes um, combined algebra and geometry to make algebraic equations for circles and, and, and parabolas and so forth. So there was a marriage of physics and mathematics. I like this picture a lot. It's from 1537. Uh, this is lots of wise people. And back here are um, Aristotle and Plato. Uh, there's Euclid at the letting people in the door, uh, etc. There's a, a projectile going in the right way uh, that projectiles do, and so forth. Um, now, I'm going to skip some things. Uh, I want to come to a very famous man. Nicholas Copernicus, or Mikołaj Kopernik in, in Polish. Um, this portrait is made almost 40 years after he was dead, so I couldn't find any portrait made uh, during the time he was um, alive. Uh, he was born in 1473 in northern Poland. Um, and this town still exists. It's on the Vistula River, some 200 kilometers downstream from Warsaw. And he was born, of course, before the rise of Luther in 1517. But there was a lot of religious turmoil in, in the church and in Europe. And it was a dangerous time to be a heretic. Um, there was a serious war going on when he was born between the Polish king and the Teutonic Knights in Königsberg uh, over the control of Prussia. Uh, and cities farther north, including Danzig, or Gdansk, as it's known in Polish. And those cities chose to remain Polish. Uh, Copernicus attended Krakow University, and he was enrolled in the arts uh, faculty there. Um, but he took classes in mathematics and astronomy from a well-known professor. Um, he had a considerable collection of books. However, <laughs> Uh, in the next century, the 17th century, there was a war called the Thirty Years' War. 
and one of the invading armies in Poland was the Swedish army, and the Swedish army uh, stole all of Copernicus's books, and they are all in the library of Uppsala University, where I have actually had the chance to see them. Um, um, why they don't give those back to the Poles, I don't know, but they don't. Um, he um, worked for his uncle, who was a bishop, although he was never ordained, so far as we know, as a priest. He never married, uh, but he got into trouble with the church uh, in later life because he was considered too close to his housekeeper, whatever, whatever that was. Um, his first language was, was German. Uh, he was fluent in Latin, of course, as everybody had to be. He spoke Polish. Uh, he studied at Bologna and Ferrara so, and Padua, so he spoke Italian. And he also learned ancient Greek, so he could read um, Aristotle in the original. And uh, he attained a degree of, of um, doctor of law from the University of Ferrara. Um, but most of the time uh, he spent uh, in, in, um, uh, in, in Poland. Um, his theory about the sun being at the center of the universe was worked on for many, many years, and people knew of it. But he was hesitant to publish, and um, people, some historians think that he re hesitated to publish out of fear of the church and the church's reaction. But that's probably not true. Most, uh, um, most uh, historians think he was just afraid of, of ridicule. And he was ridiculed by Martin Luther. He was dead by this time, of course. Um, a, in 1540, he died in 1543, but in 1540, a German professor from Würzburg, who was Protestant rather than Catholic, um, and his um, goes most commonly by his Latin name of Reticus, uh, came to Frauenberg where he lived to study Copernicus's manuscripts, and um, he is responsible for eventually getting published um, the the real book um, on the on on the revolution of of celestial objects. Uh, it was dedicated to the Pope. Uh, at the time, and um, it was the length of the year as defined by Copernicus uh, that has been used, uh, that was used to create the Gregorian calendar, which is used worldwide. And it's not used everywhere, which I found out to my surprise. It is not used in Iran or Afghanistan. Um, it is not used in Ethiopia or in Nepal. And other countries use it, but use a second calendar uh, as well. And uh, those would be um, India, Bangladesh, and Israel. Um, and some countries use a modified Gregorian calendar, Taiwan, Thailand, North Korea, and Japan. Um, the book was dedicated to Pope Paul III, but it was published in Nuremberg, which was a Protestant city, and it had an introduction written to it by um, a man named Osiander. And he pretended that this preface was written by Copernicus, and it wasn't, he wrote it. And it, the preface to this book said, this isn't real, it's just all mathematics, so now, Copernicus did not believe that. Copernicus clearly believed that the Earth rotates about the sun. All is beneath the moon with the scribe among the other planets, a great orbit round the sun, which is the center of the world. 
and that what appears to be motion of the sun is in truth the motion of the earth. And the distance is as nothing when compared to the sphere of the fixed stars. And that's a very pregnant thing. And there were problems with this, serious problems. Um, they were, um, the motion of the Earth conflicts with Aristotle's I ideas, of course. Well, that's OK. You can get rid of that. Copernicus insisted that gravity was a local phenomenon and not a universal one that had to be worried about the motion of the sun. But the biggest problem was the lack of what is called stellar parallax. And so parallax is the following. Suppose I stand here and I look at this pretty woman over here, and I measure the angle that my line of sight takes. Okay. Then I walk over here one meter, two meters, three meters, four meters, five meters. I walk over six meters, and I measure this angle. Now, in a triangle on flat Earth, if I know the base and two angles, I know everything about the triangle. Okay? So I can tell the distance to her from either of these points. Okay? Now, when you try to do that with a star, and you um, as, as um, was done by various people. So you measure the position of a star from, uh, as Tycho Brahe did, from Denmark, and then you go to Germany and measure the position. Again, you get exactly the same angle. And what that means is that the distance to the star is enormous. And it's so enormous that even if you use the longest possible baseline, that is the diameter of the circle that the Earth makes, that you look at these positions of the stars, they are not different. You get the same answer. You get the same angle. And this meant that the stars had to be a gazillion miles away, as of course they are. But in, 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 in Ptolemy's theory, the universe is pretty small. And so, there was a serious problem. And that problem from 1543 wasn't solved until 1820-something um, when uh, the Frenchman Fresnel actually managed to measure the, uh, a star's distance by parallax. And he got 11.3 light years. <clears throat> 